This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E.com. I don't know if listeners can appreciate the impact of, of, of Phil's setup. P- I think people would think I'm exaggerating when I said I didn't know. Twice now, this room is not big. How big is this room? Was it 12 by 12? Uh, it's about 14 by 15, I think. Okay, 14 by 15. Yep. And there's been two times I've been... There's no internal walls. No curtains. And two times I've been in here and been startled by Phil's presence. <laughs> Or because mad of, that he's not here and he was actually or here. Yeah, I got, well, earlier I was mad that he wasn't here at work, but he was back there <laughs> behind his array. I got to admit, I kind of like it th- that way. I like being a little hidden. This is the third time I brought it up. Yeah, it's really it's really bugging you. It's stuck in your craw. Dude, I can't even see you if I try, you know? Yeah, that's right. Well, the listeners can see me right We're now. kicking around either putting little pictures of Phil where he would normally be. Or making a, an elect if any, if there's any mirror specialists out there, mm. it's a good project. I had an electrician yeah. the other day ask me if I ever needed any electrical work. He'd be happy to do it, but he was in Texas. But if there's a mirror specialist in town that had could array, I guess it'd be one mirror that he's looking at. Then that mirror blasts off the wall behind him. Yeah, and then a mirror by the muskox picks it up. Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, we'd have to consider it from all angles, too. So I think this room would be mostly mirrors at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be like one of those things at like county fairs that you walk into and you run into the walls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And people yeah. that make action movies can't help but have shootouts in them. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Which one's real? <laughs> um, uh, Chester, what, can, can you uh, produce that, your jigging rap again? Oh, yeah, yeah. Chester put me on to a phenomenal jig and rap bite last night. How phenomenal? We caught our limit of Wally dogs. Which is what, four or five? Yeah. Um, little shavers. Great eaters. Oh, eat, yeah. yeah. Perfect eaters. Like what Seth's saying, when walleye, there's no such thing as small walleyes and big ones. There's eaters and biggins. Yeah. It's like it's a win-win, eaters and biggins. But the jig rap is, a, is the G, yeah, little shavers, mm-hmm. eaters. That is a lethal weapon. These things are, <laughs> it is, it, it really like, is. Like the odds of that walleye being just hooked in the lip are low. Well, the thing, so these are, are glide baits uh-huh. essentially. And any glide bait kind of has little wings on it. And it's a very sporadic darter bait. So they go, pew, pew, oh, yeah, pew, all over. And the fish cannot help. But like, they're just like, see something dart by their face and pop in the mud and they go and investigate it and like, kind of, they kind of like hop on top of it essentially. And then you go to do your, your quick jig again. And next thing you know, when you're next thing, you know, you got one. I'd love to have a camera down there. See what's going going on. on, Well, you know, when I use, uh, now that I use, so for link, when I used to use lead head jigs with a big grub body on them, they can catch it. You know, and you, you get fewer misses. Sure. I've been on to like slow pitch and flutter jigs last couple of years. Man, they have a hard time catching it. Like, because oh, it's moving it's like, when it's bam, going down. He misses it. You'll feel him. Yeah. Bam. He'll miss it. Bam. He'll miss it. Bam. And then he either gets bored or you hook him on the third or fourth time. Yeah. Or he gets like, screw this. And he just goes off looking for something easier to catch. But I think they they can't grab it. Sure. So it's, it's too erratic. It's, yeah. They're, it, it's unpredictable. Mm-hmm. But they sure want to bite it. Yeah. You should get a um. You should get a a, a, a what do you call them again? Jigging wrap. You should what? get a jigging wrap sponsor. Glide bait. Yeah. Um, Someone should send Chester like a bunch of glide baits. Oh, you just get a mold because that's start like a real, on your own. That's like a That'd real cost. Cool. Chester when he's doing the when he's doing his family finances. 
He's like, rent. Tackle. Rent. Jigging rats. Jigging rats. <laughs> Car well, payments. Those are probably, what, eight eight bucks a pop, too? Eight, nine bucks. Yeah. Yeah. I got that one for Chester because I lost one of his yesterday. Well, thank you, Brody. Are we going to hang this in the podcast studio? No, Just you put it right that. I would like to hang a big old jigging rat down there. Fun. Dude, we were talking about, though, you ne- they need to make some of these for when you guys are up in Alaska at the Fish Shack, a big one for Lingcod. 12 ouncer yeah i think that i was saying man if you could get like a 10 or 12 ounce jig and wrap you would do two things one you'd snag everybody else like you'd be like guys i'm gonna fish lines out i'm gonna fish for a while True. <laughs> by myself yep clear the anchor yep. and then uh the other thing is is you yeah you'd get a lot of hits yeah you gotta be you gotta be careful with them though they're dangerous. This is like the number one thing getting your fingers hooked right here. Oftentimes, I'll clip off this front front hook here because rarely you do you do you hook them on there. Um, but anyways, jig and wrap, great bait. Um, we'll come back to something else you got sitting there that I want to talk about. Okay, I'm holding Brody's. You gonna bring this off to Alaska? Yeah. <laughs> I'm if holding. You, bro- you, tell, tell tell about this. Your your priest here, man. <clears throat> that my dad made that. That's a homemade persuader. I think he called it. Um, we used to call him the priest. <laughs> yeah, because it gives your last rites. Yep. Persuader. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, my dad made that, and in, in uh, like the late, I think I got the it's time frames roughly correct. But Lake Erie used to have a salmon fishery. Like started sometime in the '60s and didn't last long, like a decade maybe a little longer. Um, and my dad would troll for coho, like on the beaches. Out down in, riggers or just between the bars? No, he was in a canoe with a little two and a half foot Evinrude. He just, oh, really? Like yeah, between the sandbars and stuff? Yeah, like... We just catch some nice browns. 50, 100 Pe- yards off would, the beach. I, I caught some, but people would catch nice browns like yeah. that trolling the beach. He'd troll spoons and like bomber plugs and shit like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he would catch one, he'd put a notch in that sucker. Well, I'll tell you right now how many. Oh, really? That's like gangs in New York. Wait, is that wood or is that is that a? No, no, it's it's a steel rod under there. Um, he got sixteen. But uh, that that uh, it's satisfying. What's under there? Steel rod. What's on the outside? It's like a baton. I don't know why he put that rubber coating on there. So he could cut notches into it, I Dude, guess. Dude, whenever Steve gets something like that in his hand, he <clears throat> oh. just has this look in his eye. Oh, yeah. Because I'm just picturing, man, like <laughs> Brody, like in trivia or something. And I'm just, wham! <laughs> <laughs> yep. You're wrong. But that, uh, that salmon fishery, they changed their management for Lake Erie and went to Steelhead. They don't manage for salmon at all anymore. No. Yeah. Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania. Occasionally one shows up. I don't know where they're coming from, but yeah, that, that thing didn't last long. You get a, they got like a six week season for those salmon, at least like mm-hmm. inland, you know, on the streams and beaches and stuff. But they're not stocking the piss out of them. They're not. It's a steelhead game now. Yeah. And some of the other areas in the Great Lakes, they've really started to um, emphasize uh, native lake trout. Right. Right. Yeah. Doing more around. There's some of those doing showing more up around in, lake yeah. trout recovery, not worrying yep. so much about the Pacific Sand. Yeah. There's all kinds of shit that, like, w- Lake Erie, I think, used to have a commercial whitefish fishery. Sure. Yeah. They don't anymore. They used to have a commercial walleye fishery. Yeah. I mean, still a fantastic walleye fishery. Oh, oh yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Is it because people don't want whitefish or there are no whitefish? The, there, I, I think it has a lot to do with the pollution that no, was going no, on. No, no. They destroyed, I mean, in the 1800s, they destroyed the sturgeon fishery. They destroyed the whitefish fishery. You know, one of the biggest things they did in the Great Lakes to ruin the fisheries in the Great Lakes, the original fisheries, is when they were logging all that, they would raft all that. Um, they would raft all that, all those trees, all that white pine and stuff. They would raft it and the bark would come off. So in all the bays and estuaries and stream mouths during that period just became covered in, 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 in some cases, over 20 feet of bark. Deep? And destroyed, yeah. 20 feet deep. Oh, yeah. Destroyed spawning habitats. That Whoa. was like one of many things. And he had, you know, the tan, like at, at that time, the tanneries were horrible. Yeah. All kinds of pollution. Um, and so many of those fish, like the sturgeon and the whitefish that were just very, very sensitive to any kind of disturbance. Um, the food sources got all screwed up 
And so they started just trying to backfill it with other stuff. So, like, when I was growing up in Lake Michigan, we had um, we had three of the five Pacific salmon. Yeah. yeah. We had pinks. Kings and... Or pinks silver. or humpies. Yeah. Kings or chinook. Co-hos. Silvers or cohos. I never heard of them doing dogs or chum, dog slash chum. I never heard of them doing sockeye. Mm-mm. And then they up up this guy up in uh, Sault Ste. Marie worked for a long time on Atlantics. Yeah, I think so there's to bring Atlantics in the, yeah, in Ontario now. To bring in the one Atlantic salmon. Yep. And they would take these Atlantics. There's a thing. Uh, I lived up there for a short period of time and did a semester of school at Lake Superior State University, which reminds me of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Let me tell you something about that in a second. Um, up at Lake State University, they, there's this thing called the Sioux Edison Hydroelectric dam and when water comes off lake superior it drops about 23 feet i think which forms the sioux rapids so superior sits i think i think it's 23 feet higher than huron okay so the connection between lake superior and huron you know and it eventually obviously goes out the saint lawrence seaway you know out, yeah. out, out into the atlantic but that drops 23 feet through the Sioux Rapids into the St. Mary's River, which is a very short river that then flows into Huron. And they used to peel water off of, not used to, they still, they peel water off of, the, off of Lake Superior on top of the falls, run it through town in this, like, we, everybody calls it the power canal, run it through town, and then and then get gain that twenty three feet of drop, right, and blast it through this hydroelectric facility, which had I don't remember how many turbines, forty or fifty turbines or whatever. Um, one one of the first articles, the first article I ever sold for a chunk of change was about fishing for whitefish and steelhead in the discharge canals. That's as far as they could get, like spawning. Well, so so many mayflies. It was real silty in there, and there'd be these huge mayfly hatches in that power canal. And so when the mayflies were hatching there, all that shit's going out that yep. through that high through those turbines and shooting back out into St. Mary's River. And so fish at the right time of year would just jam into all of these turbine outflows, and they're like these like. It looked uh, similar to a uh, underpass bridge, a cone, like a half culvert, yep. a half round culvert, just big enough to pull a boat into. You could pull a skiff into the thing. And what I wrote my article about was uh, my, my my brother Danny and our buddy Dros. They pioneered this thing, and I just would go with them after they pioneered it. But they would, on occasion, leave the bar at closing because <laughs> the good turbines were coveted. And they would leave the bar and just go and pull in there and sleep in there. And you, there's a there's the eye bolt sticking out of the top, and they would just tie off and it's warm in there. And you're in the dam. There's probably no way they let you do and this you got, anymore. Right, that, you got their cream no spot. And they Sounds would sleep in dangerous. there. And then old men who'd get up early to get the spot would get thwarted <laughs> because there's college dudes up in there sleeping in there. Half drunk. And then you just lower the rope back at daybreak, and we would take it. Take a so we would the, the the rig they would use, and again, like they pioneered it. I just benefited from them pioneering this whole strategy. They would take a fly rod. And you remember those? Remember that reel called a Martin multiplier? Mm-mm. Remember to me to bring this back around to Atlantic salmon. So there was a a geared fly reel. So not one to one. Like you could take up some serious line with a Martin right. multiplier reel. You follow me? What do you? What the hell you call it? You know what I'm talking about, Chester? I, I don't know. I, like one I, crank on the handle is a bunch of revolutions on the spool. Yeah, I, I'm. It's not ringing a bell. What? Type it in. That's not what a center pin is. That's different, right? Type in Martin multiplier. That's what we called them anyway. We used to use the. We used to do all the salmon and steelhead stuff with these. These. Were you fishing? Like with a fly line or just... No, hear me out. All right. 
So you would run, remember that stuff called amnesia? Yep. Okay. That hard mono. You'd put backing on, regular amount of backing, and then you'd put a bunch of amnesia on there. Okay, whatever. 40, 50 yards of yep. amnesia. Then eight feet of whatever, 12 pound maxima, mm -hmm. and then a, a tippet. Depending, you might use four pound maxima, six pound maxima. Off that, you put split shot where the heavy maxima met the light maxima, and then we just do you do like a little fly for, for so for fishing this thing. And that's what we would use for steelhead and salmon too. Mm -hmm. But for fishing this thing, and then you'd use a little fly tip with a maggot, and with that amnesia, you'd lay all that amnesia in the. You'd get a bunch of amnesia laid in the on the bow of the boat and you got that split shot on there. So you could like, you could shoot it way up into that culvert. How wide was that thing? How wide was the culvert? Yeah. It'd be about the size of that wall right there. All right. Hit me with the dimensions of this room again, Phil. About 14 by 15. So it may be like a 12 foot tube. Shoot it up into that dark tunnel. Cause you could take that line and with all that lead on there, you could just <laughs> and shoot it perfectly. Right. Yeah. Up in there, and then you'd get tight on it, and you'd it'd fall. It's the water's hauling ass out of there, but it'd fall, and you'd be able to stand there. You could stand there and look. That water's so strong. It, that current's so strong coming out of your boat. You know your boat is in a yeah, fast current. Swinging. Your boat's swinging back and forth. And if it was a clear day with the right sun, you'd look down and see whitefish and steelhead <laughs> darting all around down in there. But you'd shoot it way up into the turbine in order to get down. Yeah. 10, 12, 14 feet down, and you'd be hooking them right under your boots. Hmm. So much Crazy. fun. And then when you hook one with all that current. Oh, they're but back, they blast back behind you. Not exactly a, a purest fly fishing method. No. no. So those or because the maggot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are just multiplier reels. Multiplier yeah, reels. Large like a large arbor multiplier reel. Yep. God, that was fun, man. Sounds like Steve. It. Sounds like you need like a jig and wrap or something back then. Yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> that having jig and wrap. Yeah. So the the university somehow the Sue Edison electric thing had gifted a couple of these turbines to Lake State University's fisheries program. Okay, and there was a guy there at that fisheries program who was dicking around with trying to introduce Atlantics. That was back when they were still okay with introducing all kinds of crazy stuff. And he converted some of these hydroelectric channels into rearing mm -hmm. habitat because he's just running actual river water, right? He's running like high velocity river water through this thing. And you'd go in there and they'd take, I watched him do it one time. They'd take, they'd take a bunch of, of roe from a fish. I mean, literally, in a five-gallon bucket, you got a bunch of fish eggs in a five-gallon bucket, you dump in like a scoop of semen, stir it up with a paddle, and it's ready to go. Yep. Fertilized. And they, so they had these raceways, and they would rear these Atlantics in these raceways. So we're talking like, like I can't remember, let's say it was 40, someone pull up a picture, pull up Sue Edison Hydroelectric Dam, you can count the turbines. Let's say there's 40 turbines. The, the university owned like turbine two, three, four. And he'd raise Atlantics in one of these, in two of these turbines. How he, are they keeping them in there? They just because it was all retrofitted. It was like he was just using this spot where all this natural river yep. water to come through. And I don't, I can't remember how they right. rigged up, but it just looked like these little fish tray raceways that had right. actual temperature controlled water coming yeah. through them. And he'd rear Atlantics in this thing. Okay, there's eight like. No, way more than eight. Dude. Oh, here we go. Here it is. Chester, report back in a second. Chris, this is what the whole show is about. <laughs> <laughs> so, but hear me out. I'm hearing you this out. This is just going to start getting interesting okay. now. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been yet? No. Okay. So check this out. So it was like turbine number, I can't remember what it was. Let's, let's say it was turbine number five was the Atlantic Salmon Raceway. Okay. Um, he'd rear them in there until they're of whatever the hell size uh, Atlantic salmon is when it goes back to the ocean and then cut them loose. Okay. This is right there. They cut right them there. loose. Yeah. So you know how salmon returns to its natal spawning stream? 
these Atlantics that go out, okay, and get big, get huge, and those sons of bitches would come back, and I'm not kidding you, to that terminal, turbine, raceway number five, yeah. they had to fence it off. Raceway number five would be stacked with giant Atlantics who were like, I'm home. <laughs> Anyone home? Yeah, I'm not kidding you, man. Huge Atlantic salmons. And then raceway, what I say, five? Yeah. Okay, raceway four and six would have some, like two or three. Right. Raceway seven and three might have one, but they were in, they knew That's cool. what that smelled like. Yeah. And they were like there. And the reason they had to fence it off is because the Ojibwe, they had snagging rights, like the native, the native mm-hmm. tribe there had snagging rights, but they sort of felt like these Atlantics kind of fell outside <laughs> of snagging rights, so they had to fence it off so they couldn't cast a snagging hook in there and drag those Atlantics yep. back out of there. That's what I was getting at, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Great Lakes fisheries. Um, oh, Brody's little beaten stick. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's a nice beaten stick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, now to bring this full circle back to the Edmund Fitz. Oh, when we're doing the when we're doing the book tour, I don't think Brody caught this because he was off BS with trivia fans. But uh, a guy comes up to me and he says, "He's like, dude, what in the world is with the Edmund Fitzgerald thing all the time?" No, I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> he had a, he wanted to complain about it. What'd you tell him? I told him I couldn't really explain it. <laughs> you never get it or you don't. He never even listened to the song. Mm. He's just filing a complaint. A lot of people come up to file complaints. Little ones. What are some other picky stuff? Uh, well, I told. Were you here when I told you about what someone came up to me to talk about with Corinne? I don't know. I think I need to put on my glasses for this. No. That she, uh, they thought she looked smart. They couldn't figure out why she did so bad at trivia, and they looked at her picture, and it was especially <laughs> confounding because she looked so smart. <laughs> uh, smart and getting you know good scores says, on trivia. It says don't that equate. had eighty turbine. <laughs> Chambers. Does that sound right? And only 40 of which were used when the plant was operated? Yeah, that could be. That sounds about right. I like counted, but it was it was hard. For well, I can't count. remember the numbers, but I think that we used to have a real affinity for like 24 and 26 or something like that because they were higher velocity for some reason. Dude, I wish I... Yeah, I'd like to go back there and hit that fishery. God, that was a lot of fun. I was going to ask you if you know if it's still going on there. Dude, when we were at Lake State, man, we lived off the land. Seriously. Me and my roommates, we ate four deer between deer October. And whitefish. We ate four deer between October one archery opener and Christmas break. And how'd all, you get all that hunting and fishing done if you were in school? Just didn't take the school too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I transferred out, man. That's an old trick people don't realize. If you live in a state, if you live in a state like Michigan has this deal where if you bounce around, like I went to three colleges, right? If you bounce around, the other colleges will accept your credit hours but they don't care about the GPA. So if you're in Michigan, this is a hot tip for Michiganders. If you're in Michigan, never start where you're going to finish. And your fi- finishing school might, how many, what, how many credit hours is like a college degree? I think it's like 108. No, I think it might be 180. Is I was going to say 120. 120. So they'll, they'll, yeah, you they'll, might be. They might dictate to you that they want you to wrap her up like, they want you to get the final 80 or whatever it is. Like a what, school, like let's say you wind up at MSU. Spencer's right. It's because it'd be eight times 15 roughly. 120. Okay, yeah. 120. So let's say you're going to land at where I, where I landed at. I landed at Grand Valley State University just to close her out. Okay. Grand Valley State's going to dictate to you that they're like, to get a degree from us, you have to get your final X number of mm-hmm. hours from I think I actually had to do more credit hours than was normal. I had to do like an extra few because I needed to hit their minimum requirement. You go to other schools, easy ones, and ones where you can fish and hunt. A go lot. there and hunt and fish. <laughs> All you gotta do is pass. Okay, it's serious. This is I'm not joking. This is true. Yeah. All you have to do is pass. So your goal was definitely not to learn anything. No. <laughs> All you have to do is pass. C's get V's. You go to where you want to go. Then you got to do good. Yep. And you get, you leave with a fake GPA. You get a, you graduate with a GPA that is not reflective of your <laughs> college experience. It's only reflective of where you wrapped her up. So 
I wrapped her up at GVSU and I walked out of there with like a three six something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go mess around when you're taking all that gen ed shit your your freshman sophomore year. So I did two years of night classes at my local community college. My first two years of college, night classes. I didn't go down until six at night. Were you still living back in Twin Lakes? Yeah. I was trapping. Yeah. Trapped all day. Hunted all day, whatever else I had going on. Chopped firewood. Went to school at night. Walked out of there. And I was in the same position as all these jokers that were working hard. And in the end, had a good GPA and got into a good graduate program. Yeah. I would have I I like take, taken you for a little bit higher than a 3.6 kind of guy. 3.6 is pretty impressive. That's pretty yeah. high. Yeah. 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 It's pretty high. But That's high. Man, 3.6 is great. Dude. I wasn't sure when that was going to turn into a hot tip, but it, it's a hot tip. No, it is. Yeah. yeah. There's great. so much to do a pamphlet. But, did, but you got to remember how old I am. Like They might have changed. They might have figured this right. out and <laughs> caught up to people. Did you, this was a common practice among my social circle. Did you brew your own beer in college, too? Living no, off the land? No, but my, my brothers brewed beer in high school. Mm. Yeah. Did that work out for them? The problem they would have is it would get a quarter inch of white stuff on the bottom and it didn't matter. You'd have to open it so gradually and gently to not disturb the mm-hmm. yeast. Stuff. It's the yeast yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like most parents, like you can't drink in high school for whatever reason. Like we weren't supposed to drink, but for whatever reason, if they like mm-hmm. they, they made, the other they would way. make this beer and it was just my parents were fine with it because they thought it was interesting. <laughs> so I had buddies who uh, got like beer making kits at garage sales and they had dollar signs in their eyes. Like think mm. of how far ahead we're going to come. And it yeah, just never, never worked out. They never made big money. No. no. Um, God, I had some other thing I was going to add in here. Something about not being able to, Oh, gee. <laughs> Corinne, I'm, I know we had a whole plan, but. Do what you Steve want. Steve hasn't even got show. to a talking point yet. No, I gotta, <laughs> add, I gotta add one thing about fish priests. Yeah, then I'm done. This then I'm is done. this is exciting though. I can't wait. Fish priests. When I I wasn't allowed to get bad grades in high school, like I had to get an A or B. If I got A's or B's, nothing bad happened to me. And um, in wood shop, I got a bad grade because we had to do a lathe project. Seems, seems unlike you, wood shop. Right. I know. Well, because for the lathe project, wait, I made a, a large wooden mallet. It's the. <laughs> it, it spins wood. It spins wood, and oh, then you and use then you, the tools oh, and okay. it shaves it off. So okay, we had to so laminate. We were supposed to laminate a stack of wood together, and then lathe it into something cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I lathed mine into like a very coarse cylinder, drilled a hole in it, and put a handle in it, so that I had a big, <laughs> heavy wooden mallet that I was saying was like a fish priest. Got a bad grade, and then my dad took me down to school to have a. Like a arranged a little conference. I got a C minus. But that why would you get a bad grade for that? That's that doesn't seem because like people were making really grounds. cool stuff. They're making lamp stands. Oh, okay. And Steve so just they made were like saying, a block and I made a, wood. a block, a cylinder. <laughs> <laughs> I made an eight inch cylinder. Yeah, and it was like, okay, well, no, okay. it's a mallet. <laughs> <laughs> I made a duck call okay, for my sure. project. Oh, Most guys I, were making I cool see. stuff, or they were okay. making their parents lamp stands. Okay, I. I I thought and then that drilling them out and wiring them. I was like, all I need is a handle. <laughs> I, I thought that the teacher was being unfair and kind of judging you not on your level of relative level of skill, but on the fact that you were making something used to, you know, he, beat, he, beat other. He yeah. thought I was okay. being a smart ass. Yeah, okay. And he thought I was being a slacker, both of which are true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I don't know. We just wanted to go back to sniffing wood glue. I don't know. What we're doing. <laughs> yeah. like, but anyhow, um, well, you got to tell us what ha- would your old man do? Oh, well, he was pissed and took me down. Pissed at you or pissed at the? No, pissed at me. I got you. And took me down and humiliated me in front of the teacher, and then I had to improve my grade. Would you make? Extra a- work. Yeah, would you make? I, after that? I don't remember what I made after that, huh? but he was he was not happy. And my dad was a big woodworker, so it kind of stung, you know. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like if one of my kids got a bad grade in hunting. <laughs> <laughs> Should I skip this thing about the Edmund Fitzgerald? I'll, I'll put it, I'll say this. Um, you know, when David Grand was on and he said all those things that have a maritime background? Yeah, that was so interesting. Under the weather. Um, the other ones. I under know, the there weather. Are so many. Uh, three sheets to the wind. Um, it's like one more good one that we say all the time, but we have no idea what. I forgot. Doesn't matter. It does matter. 
<laughs> trying Ga- to make oh, a point, gang but... pressed. Okay. Um, whole pile of them. Yeah, that's a that's a fight. Underwriter, an insurance underwriter. Mm. I, I just As, I just googled maritime yeah. uh, nautical phrases. Pipe down. Yep. Is that one oh. of them? Um, batten down the hatches. Yeah. High and dry. Yeah. Scuttlebutt. Yep. Through, oh, through thick and thin. <laughs> Smooth sailing. I mean, this seems is, obvious. This one's obvious. Sink or swim. Yeah. Yeah. You're, down you're the hatch. S- yeah. Sure. You're saying a lot of them that aren't that interesting. <laughs> Broad okay. in the beam. It was, you know what? It was interesting to listen to you struggle to come up with that. <laughs> yeah, it so, was. <laughs> apologies. You felt that was more interesting? Yes. Hear me, hear me just not say anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he broke. I know, I was having a great moment. I was having a great hosting moment, and Spencer came in and ruined it. <laughs> um, underwriting is a maritime insurance thing. Like, in the old days, they would... Uh, this is kind of interesting. So he, so the connection to Edmund Fitzgerald. And this is the last note on the Edmund Fitz. Uh, the boat was uh, that the boat was actually owned by an insurance company. It was owned by Northwestern Mutual Insurance Company mm. out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The company had invested a lot of their earnings in iron ore and mineral mining. The Ed- Edmund Fitzgerald was just the CEO of Northwestern Mutual when they built the ship. I had no idea. That that's is that is not mm. cool. That's like in the old days. In the old days, you would it was okay for you to name birds and animals after yourself. That's considered not cool anymore. Um. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Baron? No, Stellar. Stellar. He's got all kinds Barrett, of stuff. Stellar. Stellar's like I'll take that J. Merriam. I'll take that C line. Whatever. Lewis. It's everything you saw. Yeah, Lewis. And um, now it's it's uncool. You don't name stuff after right. yourself anymore. There's a movement now to give things names from in, indigenous peoples, indigenous languages. It, it this, also seems fashionable to name things after other people, though. That, right? Like, like cool Attenborough has a lot of things named after him that he didn't discover. Yeah, but that's I think that's cool. That's okay uh, because you're paying you're like paying homage. Sure. You're uh, paying homage, homage. In Edmund, and this guy, this guy, but this is guy, just like he's a big the CEO. Ass ego. He's like. I got a great name for the boat. <laughs> um, he helped bring baseball back to Milwaukee is what yeah. I'm reading too. Yeah, In your head, who was Edmund Fitzgerald before you learned this? Never thought about it. Like a war captain? That's, Never that's thought who it was it. to me. No. Uh, they used to be able to publicly, you would publicly sell insurance on cargoes and vessels. An underwriter was just someone that would write their literally write their name under the post looking for insurers. That is pretty interesting. Uh oh, you remember how I was saying well, never mind. <laughs> I feel like if this happened today, it'd be a conspiracy theory. Oh, certainly. Like an insurance company mm-hmm. guy named it after himself to get famous when it sank. Couldn't happen. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite movies. Uh, I don't like the book, but I like the movie. That doesn't happen very often. Is Inherent Vice. And there's a pro- a prominent character in Inherent Vice played by Benicio Del Toro is a maritime lawyer. Um, and Inherent Vice, so it's a Thomas Pynchon novel. Inherent Vice in maritime insurance is all the things that one can't control. Like shipping on the seas, there's inherent vice. Things rot, things get wet, whatever. It's like, you know, when you see like act of God yep. stuff, inherent vice is just stuff's going to happen to the cargo. Mm-hmm. Uh, two pieces that came out from. So does, we, we've had a podcast guest on, I, I believe maybe a couple times, Ed Arnett, who used to be the chief scientist at Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. And he left TRCP on, on, on great terms because he, he got to go and be the CEO of the Wildlife Society. And the Wildlife Society funds and orchestrates. I might be screwing this up. Someone look that up. What do they call their mission statement? They fund and orchestrate wildlife research. Spencer's got it. Fast typer. What is the Wildlife Society's mission statement? Our mission is to inspire, empower, and enable wildlife professionals. It starts with giving you the resources to succeed. Yeah, there you go. So they, they publish a lot of new 
uh, wildlife research coming out. And there's two that, that Ed passed along to us recently. One I'd caught went up this, but this, this is like a month old now or so. Florida just became the latest state to have, for them to have found CWD in Florida. Mm. Uh, and you know, the odds that you found the first deer that shows, you know, you're right. It could have been, it, it, CWD could have been there for years. They just found it, you know, the, with enough testing, they found a deer with CWD. So Florida is now the, that's a good question for you, Spencer is now mm. the blank state mm. to have CWD. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's gotta be high thirties or low I was going to say 40. Yeah, that'd be a good trivia question. Why don't you find the answer to that, Spencer? Can do that. And it was because a roadway accident, a vehicular collision. Oh, is that where the deer came from? Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? Yeah. Testing yeah. roadkill? Yes. No, uh, yes. Huh. Because um, hunters probably don't really get him tested too much. I mean, Perhaps in Florida, not. Not. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. mandatory. I mean, there's a massive amounts of... Uh, there's no way that... I, I bet you anything, there's more hunter tested... I don't know this for a fact... But I bet you there's more hunter tested deer than roadkill tested deer. Maybe in not. Florida? Oh, Florida, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying oh, in Florida. Yeah, in a super yeah. populated state like that. This one, some... this was a, the white tailed deer had been struck by a vehicle in Holmes County. Hmm. And uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission confirmed the presence of chronic wasting disease in this wild deer that was killed on the highway. This says this says thirty one U.S. states and four Canadian provinces. That's as of June 16, twenty twenty three, from the USGS. Alaska and Hawaii will obviously be the holdouts. We were talking to that guy on the book tour. He said Utah hasn't had any yet, I'm the, which and, surprised me. Yeah, I think it's it's coming. At, at this, current, it, it, it's, it's, does that what, say what, it's there? This map shows Utah yeah. is uh, full of it. Yeah. Oh. With current regular under current guidelines and the way they're handling it right now, and the way that the USDA is looking at deer breeders and stuff, it's everybody will have it except yep. for Hawaii and except for Hawaii in Alaska. And Alaska is getting you know they, they get mule deer coming into yeah. Alaska now and then, and it's shoot on site for mule deer right. in Alaska. Uh, another one, and we've talked about this a bunch, but and I haven't really looked into this, but sometimes people, you'll live in a state and there might not be any wild pigs in your state, or there might be a few wild pigs in your state, and they will all of a sudden say it's illegal to hunt wild pigs, and you'd say to yourself, well, that seems stupid. If we're trying to get rid of wild pigs, why would it be illegal to kill wild pigs? What's motivating that mm -hmm. legislation is they realize that the, like, what is caught, not, not CWD here, we're talking about another thing that spreads, um, Hunters spread wild hogs. Yeah. Pig enthusiasts. Pig enthusiasts. It, it, it's weird when you go down to some of those places, you know, down in like Texas and in Florida, because they'd be, people would be like, ah, oh, kind of, you know, I want you to get all the pigs off my property. But then they're also like, they like, like having them around, oh. you know, <laughs> there's like this weird vibe there. That's a hobby of mine. Is I like to ask landowners who complain about pigs, if they could, two, there's two questions. I'm like, if you could may wave a magic wand and they just would be gone. I've never met someone that said yes. <laughs> there I was like, well, yeah, right. not all of them. Yeah. Cause they, you know, people like to eat them. Yeah. People like to eat them. And the other thing is, and you always bring this up to people is, uh, like Cal was telling a landowner in Hawaii, this they're talking about complaining about the pigs. And Cal said, I know how you can get rid of all these pigs, put up a big sign. That says, please hunt this property. Yep, for sure. And the person said, you know what kind of people we'd get on this property if we did that? To which Cal said, barbecuers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, tells I talking about? The pigs. Oh, so there's this, there's this, also this thing in, in a, a wildlife society article, like a, like a journal article, um, that, State that, that there's that, that, that this article is arguing that states that are being strict around strict around um, not being able to move wild hogs, not being able to hunt wild hogs, right? Like very line in the sand about wild hogs are slowing the spread more than states that are facilitating the hunting of wild hogs. It makes sense that it's effective. 
Yeah. And when I look, you know, Missouri, I remember being in Missouri where they were say, like, like I can't remember, I was talking to a wild hog expert and he, he was like, they were categorically, that's how they're there. Mm-hmm. They're there for people that go down south and they like hunting hogs and why not have them closer to home? Yeah. We talked the other day about when we, um, uh, when we had that uh, Zeb Hogan, Zeb Hogan on, um, we're talking about fish that are tolerant. We spend a lot of time on fish that can handle fresh and salt water or not. And we're talking about the spread of Northern Pike out of the Susitna drainage where they were introduced by someone that likes to fish Northerns and how from that drainage are then bouncing to other drainages by just swimming out into salt water and coming they back They can up. handle brackish really? water. No, they're going, these fish, and they can see it. When they take these fish out of these other systems, they can look at the stable isotopes, and they can see where that fish was. He, that fish mm. has marine stable isotopes, how? where that fish was spending time in the ocean and then shot up a different river system. That's neat. They're spreading through the ocean. Really? I yeah. wonder how long they can... I I, I've got a lot of questions now. <laughs> no, his ass gets washed out or whatever. I don't know. Goes on a tour. And he's like, I got to get out of here. I don't know. And finds some stream yeah. and shoots up it. And then finds a boy or a girl to, to make love to. Well, um, the pit, it's illegal to hunt them here, right? Pigs in Montana. Did they ban hog hunting in Montana? I think they might have. But I, I, I want to know... Like, I'd love to talk to someone from FWP to know... Like if they feel like it's a serious threat from Canada. Well, they branded it. What do they call them? Northern super hogs. Right, right. Canadian. I want to know if it's like. Yeah, you know what? You know what? Uh, we covered that. And I get all. I spent all this time. My kids all worked up about Canadian super hogs. <laughs> I'm like, it's. I mean, I say, I tell them, so listen. There's the one old- kind of hog. There's the whole world over. Any pig you ever ate, any piece of bacon you ever ate, anyone you ever talked to hunting wild hogs in America, same thing. It's Seuss Scrafa. It's, it's, that's, okay. The only thing that can take down those Canadian super hogs is a Canadian super wolf. Yep. <laughs> so it's Seuss Scrafa. Yeah, yeah. And he's all worked up about Canadian super hogs. And I realized that on, on our own website, when we covered that, Group that population of hogs that are north of Montana. Did we call they, them Canadians? We, they refer to them as Canadian super hogs. <laughs> what a great name! <laughs> yeah, it's like the Wisconsin super sow and Canadian super hogs. Um, but the, it's it's it can be they're demonstrating here that that those regulations which strike you as being so counterintuitive. If we don't want hogs, why would we not hunt them? Mm-hmm. That it's actually effective in preventing the. Um, introduction of hogs. I mean, those outfitters and stuff down in in Texas, they make some a serious living, you know, making sure they have hogs on their properties. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's got to, They've got to be moved around and trapped. And mm-hmm. I bet you some of those guys buy hogs. You know, if they're starting to get low, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Brandon Butler, when we were hunting in Missouri for Turks, he took me out and showed me like sort of wildcat hog traps that dudes are just going out in the woods to construct hmm. for catching their own hogs hmm. in areas that have them yep. so they could bring them to bring them to places that don't. Uh, quick correction. Um, a couple corrections. So, you know, we always point out that Dr. Randall is the only doctor that works at this company. That's right, yeah. He's not. Mm-hmm. Who are we leaving out? Well, Jordan Sillers like kind of quietly snuck in with a PhD. <laughs> How the hell does he have time to be getting a PhD? I don't know. I want to get one of those. Super brain. <laughs> I need to figure out how to get one. What's his PhD in? Can it's he... in it's in English. So speaking of our meat eater website, he I I don't know if he was the person who wrote that article in the Super Hogs. What are you but... shaking your head about? Because oh, it's like <laughs> the passing judgment, dude. Jordan does oh, it. Jordan, cool. Jordan Jordan pumps the articles. Badass. Jordan, I'm not saying he does. It's like it's cool. It's everybody, not philosophy. Hey, everybody know, go it's read not, a bunch and of I have stuff. A, I have an advantage. I, you know, I'll point out. I I, I have the old right. uh, you know <laughs> MA. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just don't have a PhD. So. On our episode, Glassing for Sheds, which is quite a while ago now, when we had Ben Dedamonte on, Mm -hmm. um, 
We were talking about, can you say strewed? And that was in the context of strewed? uh of a uh, of antlers an, uh, sh- uh shed antler piles being found found by like Seized game, by fish Yeah, game. seized, not found. Seized by and then cut up like dog treats and thrown across or so scattered across public strewn land. it would so, be. Well, so, no, 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 hear me out. So, as Corinna said, so a guy got busted for hunting sheds ahead of time before an area Surprise. was open. And he had even cut some up. So, yeah, right. down in Wyoming, they just go that. back <laughs> out and they scatter them about so people can re-find them. Right. The cut-up ones? <laughs> yeah. Even the cut-ups. You're, you're finding the cut-ups. You're wow. finding Which the dog, I was pointing out is a little bit like, like Easter egg hunt. Right. You know, <laughs> like someone just was touching that egg earlier today. <laughs> so, uh, do you know all right there, Chili? Me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm great. Cat got your tongue? You guys are talking? Pull that mic up close. You guys are just talking, having a grand old time. Okay, so <laughs> um, I said that they went and strewed them about the landscape. And I thought, that can't be a word. Um, in our, And this is coming from the actual PhD. Mm. In English. In English, of all things. So he should What would know. your PhD be in? I don't think you can get a PhD in what I studied. Okay, but if you were going to... Get a PhD. Definitely not woodwork. Oh, if I was going to go now sure, and get a yeah, PhD, yeah. I, would pers- I would pursue a PhD in American history. Mm. Or would you go to law school? Well, no, that's a whole different deal. They're not yeah, PhDs. I know, but I'm just, yeah. you know, the whole ticket and raffle stuff. Oh, to study really sweepstakes ex- and raffle yeah, we law? we really need an expert on that. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I would love to be a world expert, a world <laughs> leading expert school. on sweepstakes <laughs> and raffle law, man. <laughs> it comes from the old English Struian. Or strioian, meaning to scatter. I think the reason it sounds weird is because it seems to be used most commonly as the past participle strewn. Mm, that's right. Mm. Past participles are words formed from verbs that can be used as an adjective to form perfect verb tenses. As in they were strewn across the landscape. And to form the passive voice which the, your English teachers will beat out of you eventually. So people would usually use the passive voice, the sheds were strewn, were strewn mm-hmm. on the landscape as opposed to the active wildlife officials strewed the shed on the landscape. Can you say it? Look at the, those guys strewing antlers. Oh, yeah. All right. We recently had an episode called... The guru comes up for air. Is that correct? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, right there. Episode 452, The Guru Comes Up for Air, in which we interviewed a formal apostle, a former apostle of the health guru, Wim Hof, who has strayed from the orthodoxy to question some of his judgment and character. In this, we got to talk about shallow water blackouts. And he, I don't think he wasn't familiar with shadow water blackout. I think perhaps he, he familiar. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Brody. Well, I, it felt like you were talking about one thing, and he was talking because he said he mentioned shallow water blackout, but it was like felt like you guys were talking about two different things. And, and I feel like we weren't we weren't totally clear as to why it was called. Well, that. yeah, I wasn't yeah. clear. I was like, I, my understanding. Clear. I told him my understanding is that maybe I'm wrong. My understanding is that people tend to black out by the surface. And that's where why shallow water blackout, right. but I didn't really know. So a lot out. of people wrote in. Greg Fonts wrote in about this, why it's called shallow water blackout. But I'm using this one because it's so it's so perfect, the connection, that watch this. Remember how we were talking about Sault Ste. Marie earlier? I do. Well, a Navy SEAL wrote in to offer a correction. Points out, I was born and raised in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Wow. And grew up two blocks from uh, Lake State University. Active duty SEAL. He teaches uh, SEAL medics dive medicine. Okay, so he teaches future SEAL medics dive medicine, which is why he wants to put, so highly credentialed. Here's why uh, free divers and others dive. Here's why when they black out, they black out at the surface. This will tickle your fancy. I could do the short and palatable, 
or I could do long and boring. He gives the option. Let's go with long and boring. He starts out by saying the pathophysiology is long and drawn out. Okay. Follow me. The pressure at depth pushes blood from the thoracic cavity to the peripheral space like the brain because the lungs aren't taking up much volume. Smaller lungs use less blood. So you have air and under pressure, right, that that it shrinks. Your lungs squeeze in. That's that's why like trachea squeezes, lung squeezes like an issue people can get when they're diving at depth. Yeah, and uh, I'll point out here, he doesn't have this in there, but I'll point out, you can't compress, you can pressurize water, but you can't compress water. Like no matter how much pressure you put on water, you don't make it smaller, mm-hmm. right? You don't, it doesn't, it's still, it, volume wise, it still takes up the same volume. Air under pressure, you can pressurize air. It, ha- it takes up less volume. So when you dive down and, and they talk about atmospheres, so it's like 30 feet, 60 feet, 90 feet, correlates to these, like at, these different atmospheres at which pressure becomes noticeably different. So when you go down, your lungs shrink. Because they're full of air. You went down on a full breath hold. Like I mentioned when I was teaching my boy how to hold his breath, I was saying, imagine filling your ball sack with air. <laughs> you're, de- you're, you're filling your, ch- breathe so deep, you're filling your testicles there. Could he imagine that? He laughed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then the air came out. <laughs> <laughs> and then he lost all his air. Uh, you're breathing that deep, but you go down and all of a sudden, it's pushing less. So he's saying that when this happens, Blood is moving out of there, all right? And the increase in blood being pushed to the brain. So more blood is shoved to your brain, which compensates for the lower arterial oxygen saturation that occurs when your body metabolizes the oxygen during your breath hold. So you've got a big bunch of air, and... All that blood goes in, and the blood is going somewhere, so you're sending more oxygenated blood goes to your brain, all right? which helps compensate for the fact that you're not breathing. Now, the, now the ascent, you're ascending. When you ascend, if you are so borderline that the only thing keeping your oxygen saturation in an acceptable range for consciousness, generally 25 to 20 mmHGs, whatever the hell that means, um... Uh, all of a sudden your lungs, as you near the surface, expand. your lungs fully expand. And it pulls that blood out from your, your noggin. That extra blood that was hanging out up there, your lungs go, because now, like the whole thing with the bends, right? Now your lungs are, well, the bends are different because that's breathing on a tank, not the bends. Your lungs are going back to normal. <laughs> this is the noise they're making. <laughs> right? Did you get that, Phil? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, sucks the blood out of your head. And then you pass out. And you pass out. He goes on to say, his name is Smooch, who wrote in. He goes on to say, <laughs> snobs would call this a scent blackout, but not me, no way. <laughs> <laughs> and MMHG, HG is mercury on the periodic table, and MM is millimeter, and a millimeter of mercury is a manometric unit of pressure. Got it. That clarifies things for me. <laughs> it's a it's a weird it's a weird thing that shallow water blackout. Scary. Cuz you can just be feeling pretty good and fine and then the next thing you know someone's unconscious. I haven't done it yet. Nor Thank do God. I want to. Well, yeah, but I mean I know so many people that have and if, they don't they don't they one minute the way they describe it one minute they're swimming up toward the surface and the next minute someone's blowing across their face at the surface and they're trying to figure out what the hell happened no panic so feasibly it would be a painless way to die Wait, did you say that you did it or you were close to doing it I've never shallow water no, I, no. I've never done it nope there's a thing called the samba too that, that free divers talk about and that's I've you, seen you that. Break, yeah, you break the surface, and then you, like, not beneath surface. You break the surface, and you get woozy, 
in, in tippy at the surface. They'll say you sombered, meaning you kind of like had a little bit of a, you kind of passed out a little teeny bit once you broke surface. But in shallow water blackout, let's say you black out three feet shy of the surface and stop kicking and you're underwater. Yeah. So you, you have a mammalian, you have that mammalian dive reflex. So you don't breathe right away. You sink. And, and don't do anything. And eventually, whatever amount of energy it requires to have the mammalian dive reflex activated, that subsides, and then you take your death breath. But then you're taking your death breath of water, basically. Down right? bottom. Yeah, okay. yeah. Don't they usually say that's like typically about two minutes before that happens? Oh, I don't know. I never heard. I've the heard. Time. I've heard, and I'll probably get corrected. But yeah, like when you pass out, you have ballpark about two minutes before you take that. Oh, death breath. Huh. I don't know. Someone can maybe look that up and see, but that's what I was always no, told. No, that's not, that's not, I, I would, I mean, that's not surprising to me. It's not 30 minutes. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But like they said, like if somebody passes out in water, you have about two minutes before like to find it's, them. it's lights out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And this is a big part of why, uh, you know, the serious spear fishermen that are being safe will always practice one guy on surface. One guy down, one guy on surface, one guy down. And so the guy on surface is presumably paying attention to, hey, he should have. He shouldn't be floating. He right should now. be up here by now. <laughs> <laughs> and you go down and hunt him down. I'm going to do some diving this weekend. Are you? Mm -hmm. We're at? Uh, a lake. <laughs> Montana. <laughs> in Montana. Wisconsin. <laughs> the ocean. Lake in Montana. Yep. You're taking a spear? Mm-hmm. Nice. Chili, can can you explain this? Um, can you explain that pistol? And then we're gonna hang that in the new studio. Yeah, can yeah. You explain I can. it to me for a minute. Well, do you want like the history of it, or like the story of how I got it? Both. 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 All right. So, not a very interesting interesting story how we got it. My dad got it from a work colleague back in the day that um, had a. I mean, I think she had this and like an old fifty cal flintlock, and gave the flintlock rifle to somebody else and then gave this to my dad and then it's just been hanging up in our house like for the entirety of my life okay and then pass it on down to me and my brother and then but so it's a it's a if you want to look at it oh man yeah um damn get it towards the camera no trigger guard back then huh no no and i'd actually love you ever pull that thing out of there no you want to well, yeah, break no, it open. you gotta break the back. <laughs> yeah, no, it's no, you gotta break it to get in there. Oh, like a oh, fire no, alarm. It's like nails. <laughs> no, it looks like a little hammer on a chain next to it. I don't think the case came with the gun, so you can uh, break it with your pal. Yeah, we can bust it open like a piggy bank. Yeah, you don't need to do that. That's pretty sweet, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's a it's a thirty two caliber rim fire. Wow. Um, it's an old Civil War era pistol. They made them from six eighteen sixty one to eighteen seventy four. Hmm. There's roughly about seventy-seven thousand of them made. Um, How they, many? Uh, roughly seventy-seven thousand. Yeah, and they, it feels like that. I would have guessed less a than tenth that, of that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they mass produced for sure. Um, they also think that the first thirty-five thousand in production had a very good chance of actually being in the Civil War. Got so it. would have been issued to soldiers. Correct. It was. Um, it goes. I won't read this whole thing, but it Yankees goes on. Yankees or Rebs. I think reps. I think. Mm -hmm. I think. Again. So my people weren't here yet, so I, I, <laughs> I don't need to worry about that gun having felled one of my people. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were Midwest, so it's not. Yeah. So they probably felled your people. Probably. Probably. Um, yeah, so they say the first 30, 35,000 probably were in the war. Um, hmm. And then it goes on to say, um, so all the serial numbers are on it. This is on the, the hilt. I think it's called the hilt of the handle. Right on the bottom side of the pistol grip. Oh, that piece of metal that runs. Yeah, that the plates go into. Yeah, I can't remember what I that's can't called. Remember either. But it has a serial number, and this one starts with a forty-four thousand. So it wasn't necessarily probably in the war. Oh, but what's interesting is since they only made them to eighteen seventy-four, that puts if it was made then at the last year, it's still one hundred fifty years old. Wow. Hilt says that the handle of any weapon or tool. So this this it's a revolver with no trigger guard. No. A trigger that is not trigger like. Correct. 
Um, well, that's not a great description. How would you describe that trigger? It's and then a cylinder with no no notching in the cylinder, just a smooth cylinder. Yeah, yeah. It's it's in a very rudimentary uh, bead and groove to aim it. Yeah. Yeah. Have, you, have you guys had a red dot on that thing? Oh yeah, no, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, we could. I Do mean, you know if the the barrels rifled? You know, you know, I don't. I really don't. I don't know a whole lot about like all the thing. All the research that I did on this was pretty much the same stuff. It kind of goes into the history of it, not like the the dynamics of the pistol itself. Is it like Brody's priest? His, what do you call this? Persuader. Is it like Persuader. Brody's Sam and Persuader, where it's got notches in the handle? <laughs> uh, n- no, I don't. I don't know. I uh, I think I would rather take that into a fight than this thing, though. That's for sure. I yeah. think so you don't know. Any, you don't know anybody that's ever taken that out and taken a crack on it. No, I can't say that. I have it's always been. This was hanging up in our stairwell, going downstairs, and it was there for I don't know, eighteen years that I lived there. And my dad always said, "Don't fucking touch it." So no, no. And then and then you brought it here. And then I brought <laughs> and then it. Touched it. And then I and then I I grew up and I got out of the house and uh, he's like, "Yeah, do you want it?" I'm like, "Sure." You got to take it to a gunsmith. He's gonna ca- if you pro- him, he's gonna catch you, you now. Yeah. So, I hope he gives him a big old whooping right at the office <laughs> with that it's, persuader. Yeah, with he's gonna persuader. pull his little pants down, and smack his little butt right here in the yeah. office for touching yeah. his pistol. <laughs> Chili, can I see it? Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, you got to take it to someone and make sure there's not something you should be doing to like preserve it or what you know what i mean well i mean it's 150 i think it looks pretty good for 100 sure it does but you know yeah there's probably some a better yeah. method to take care of that thing and i would actually re- be really interested in someone that knows what they're doing with that particular so style there's someone out there that knows everything about that gun yeah you know what i mean but like just like oh, as we were, but you'll get some people writing in about it from here oh i'm sure and uh my biggest curiosity is that trigger Mm-hmm. Like I want to know like how that works, and because yeah. I mean huh. th- it just looks weird. Yeah, what well, there would be some kind of uh, antique firearms enthusiast out there. Oh, maybe he's maybe there's a mirror expert who's also an antique <laughs> firearm enthusiast. <laughs> I th- He'd come and just get all this taken care of in here. Man. I think those triggers are like are relatively common because I feel like I've seen them at antique stores on like little can you, little pistols and twenty two. Can you Derringers. describe what it is? Like it just like hangs Let down. Let me take a stab there's at no, it. Yeah, there's no... There's a little uh, hang down. Yeah. A little it. teardrop shape hang down. A, and the, and the a tri- finger rest. And the trigger yeah. is like a little... S- yeah, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Great crack. Great it's crack. Like, it's, like a little, it's like a little... Button. And it's not a button. I'd have to sit and think about it for a while. I think. I think, I think. when you you know cock that like what I can picture is when you cock the handle that back, thing the right goes it extends it. yeah yep. and then it becomes whatever active and then you pull it back and I don't think it moves like oh hell I know how to explain it like you know a normal trigger it? it's like a savage accu trigger it's mm-hmm. like a savage accu trigger. If the it's only the accu part of the accu it's trigger, the sad, it's the savage accu trigger. If the if the trigger trigger was solid, and the safety blade that moves inside an accu trigger was the trigger, that was a phenomenal. Yeah, that's yep, yeah, yeah. yeah there's well, no now safety, I need to yeah. explain the savage accu. Trigger. <laughs> <laughs> Got our expert right here. Everyone, Google it. Hmm. Yeah, that's got to be a single action, right? Cock and yeah. fire. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty sweet. I like that thing. Yeah, no, it's it's great. Um, yeah, if anyone has more information about it, right they still in. making thirty two rimfire shells. You know, I can't say that they are. I don't think that they are. That's too bad. Here's yeah. like, oh, a... maybe the guys that are uh, making <laughs> our punt gun ammo. When they f- finish that, they'll be able to do this. We still got to hang that up. And still got to get the. <laughs> <laughs> so bro I'm you sure. couldn't Moving find on. you weren't able to find the email the guy sent in we recently had a guy write in I well believe, i can't believe we lost i this. found the email i just didn't find anything about an age it was the size of the skull that he mentioned. oh and that's what was certified by the state yeah they had it measured 23 inches which is gigantic and out of what state is that minnesota no kid but that's also where the oldest black bear was from too oh so a guy wrote in and he found a 23 inch Found it dead. Died right? in his on his land. Found a twenty three inch bear skull. Well, I think he might have found the bear. Oh, so like a, a, a so just for context here, all time Boone and Crockett is twenty one. Sure. Yeah, uh, enormous yeah. black bear yeah. skull. Yeah, okay. a bear died on his land, and there was some 
back and forth about whether he could claim it or it was the states and it ended up in a lawsuit. Nah, dude, I'm thinking of something different. Give me a minute. There's something different. There's okay. two bears. There's another guy that just had this old ass. Sorry, I did not phone. see that one. Sorry. No, no, no. no I thought sorry. we were talking about that campfire one. Sorry, Phil. Oh, you're good. If anyone wants to I'll fill fill it. the space with some interesting banter. Tibbets? If if the the world record Boone and Crockett Black Bear Skull measured twenty three and ten sixteenths. Yeah. So this so one, this is twenty three. Yeah. It's like uh it's gigantic. Enormous. But anyway, like well, this will probably all get cut, but this guy ended up in a lawsuit with the state over possession of that skull and got it. Which is weird because you know in a lot of places you just walk yeah, around a different and story, pick man. up deadheads, that and that guy? that world record um, was also picked up in Utah. Wait, just hold, hold off for a minute, will you? Because we're not recording right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> just a reminder that now we're doing a uh, live editing with the video. It's uh, oh. kind of a pain to cut things out. <laughs> well. <laughs> I'll make it work. I'll make it work. No, no, just uh, just me. if we can just Sorry. try to avoid it from here on out. Back to the bear. Well, I know, and he can be testy like that back there because he doesn't have to look at it. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's why I said that I prefer it. It's, like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like getting testy with a customer service rep over the phone. Uh-huh. Mm. You'd say stuff you'd never say in person. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of agree with you, but I feel like you're a little hard on Phil sometimes. I'm not hard on Phil. I wish he was here. <laughs> I wish he was here looking me in the eye. That's what the problem wants is. more Phil. Yeah, I want more Phil, not less Phil. Wow. We can talk about the oldest bear. No, I do want to hear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so, but, but it, it, either way, th- there's some dude recently wrote in, and I lost it, but he wrote in and he found this this bear, and it looked like you had taken an angle grinder and and removed its teeth, and he got some certification back, and this bear was, I feel like this bear was in the 30s, mm-hmm. and then whatever the hell state he was in, it was the oldest bear found in the state, but I can't find his thing. Yeah, but you found. That okay. The, what's the biggest black bear on record? Twenty three and ten sixteenths. It came from Utah and it was picked up. And if people huh. aren't familiar, that measurement, all it is, is length of skull and width of skull added together. Isn't it weird how the biggest of most stuff is picked up? Mm-hmm. Like so often, the biggest specimen is picked up. Yep. So the biggest bighorn sheep pick up. The biggest whitetail picked yep. up. The biggest black bear picked up. So this, so this was twenty three inches. Yep. And then the oldest bear on record was 39 years old. Out of Minnesota. Yep. Yep. That's Not sick. killed by a hunter. Died natural causes. Hmm. And then, the, so the dude that found it got in a little custody battle. And who wound up with the skull? He was, did. He did. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but that brings us around to, how Chester has an old ass bear. Yeah. I, uh, I shot this bear with a recurve. While homemade. back, home I made made the bow. That um, is badass. And this Jester. is a local bear, and it was a sow. Um, but when I brought it in to FWP, well, no, cause tell what happened before you brought it in. Tell tell us about the hunt. Oh, okay, yeah. it's a it's an interesting hunt. So um, caught it on a jigging. Rat. It was <laughs> caught it on a jigging. Rat. <laughs> I was snap jigging in a in a meadow. <laughs> Anyways, no, I, uh, in the springtime in Montana, a lot of the time you can find bears in green meadows, you know, up in the mountains, they're coming down out of the snow and chowing on uh, wildflowers and grass. And that's exactly what I was doing. I was glassing over these green meadows and this bear came out and, um, I had been glassing up another bear and this one looks substantially bigger. And I got to the edge of this field. The wind was absolutely perfect. Um, but it almost looked like a manicured field, like a, some, some landscaping company came in there and made it look all pretty. There was, there was one juniper in the middle of it. So I got to the edge of this field and the wind was right. And I took my shoes off and I was just like, I'm going to see how close I can get to this thing. Took my shoes off so I could try and be no, real, with, yeah, real I, stealthy. I didn't think it was like you had, your, your feet were itchy. <laughs> no, they weren't itchy. No, but, um, it was facing away. And like I said, the wind was right. And I just kept creeping towards it real slow, um, not crawling or anything. Using the tree between you and the bear? Nope. Just staying on its hind end. And luckily it just stayed facing away from me. And I probably got like 60, 70 yards. And that juniper was 
I was getting close to that juniper and the bear was just on the other side of it. And I was like, as soon as it gets on the other side of this juniper, I'm going to just hustle my butt up and be right there. So shake hands with it, shake hands with it. It gets on the other side of that juniper. That's exactly what I do. And it steps out broadside. It's, you know, probably 15 to 18 yards. I don't know, somewhere in there. And I shoot it and I think it's just a beautiful, perfect shot. And if any of you guys have hunted bears before, um, they got a lot of fur, a lot of hair, and uh, it can kind of be deceiving because you're shooting at a black blob, you know? Um, so I think it's just a perfect shot, and, you know, my heart's going, and it takes off down into the woods, and I, I start blood trailing, and there's no blood to be found whatsoever. And I look and look and look, and... I'm just getting super discouraged. So I start doing what every hunter would do. Uh, they grid search it, you know, and they kind of get on Onyx and and uh, start making a track. And I was gridding this hillside. And I was... Can you hold on a second? Yeah. We should just put this in the fucking discoveries thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the rest of the story, but... Well, if if you haven't figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We shouldn't talk about this. We could be a great little yeah. interstitial. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. You got to go in the book. Sorry, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. Show us your face, Phil. This would be too good of a, it's like too good of a little, <laughs> it's too good of a little snippet. Yeah. To okay. ha if it was, we, we need it in campfire for sure. Okay. No, it's, it's. Anyways. Uh, that's how, for you, how Phil. Is Phil? Oh, you just I can't tell. It. I'm I'm doing fine. Hi, okay. This is a learning process for everyone. I'm, I'll take How it. How dig Phil is back there? <laughs> Skill one to you ten. Had to guess. Show us your face again, Phil. What does it look like right now? You know what, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> Leave it in. Leave it in. Leave it in. Because it in. they don't know what happened. Except for you said it. <laughs> a teaser. Okay, can you? Ble is it easier for you to go back in and bleep stuff out, or easier just to edit the whole thing out? Uh, bleeping, probably. Okay, can you just go back and bleep all the thing that would make it? This is actually an ad for Campfire Stories. <laughs> oh, my oh great. gosh. Or just cut all the audio. Lemons and the lemonade sort of thing? Here we go. Can it'll just, you it'll, just, him, sound, it'll yeah. just sound like I'm swearing mm -hmm. the whole time. And then Phil, Normal. blur yeah. for the whole video. <laughs> I want you to blur that skull so people don't know that he got it. Okay, and, on second thought, let's just edit it out. And uh, blur out <laughs> Chester's face. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> no, Phil, just bleep, just just act like he swore a lot and bleep the parts out oh my that you think would matter, and you don't need to do any of the work. Sound, sounds good. <laughs> no work what, involved. Here's the work Phil's trying to get out of. <laughs> you, well, can wa you can watch, we're, 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 we're making, we're, we're starting to record our show, and, and, and Phil is back there in his little command and control center <laughs> hitting what camera he wants on all the time. Isn't that right, Phil? Is that how you'd express it? Camera four? Yes, it is, Steve. Back to camera one. Okay, so that's what he's that's what's going through his little head back there. And <laughs> he doesn't want to have to have a big old headache of going back in and trying to undo all of his camera work. Yeah, so on that note, I'd like to apologize for all the weird camera cuts I just made during that segment <laughs> when I thought it was going to be cut out. So just ignore those. Because <laughs> people are gonna be thinking, man, that guy's not very good at that. <laughs> That's a great story, Chester. I'm on the edge of my seat, dude. It gets and I, it you gets, already told me it that story. Gets gnarly, Is that bleepity bleep in the one in your office? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's the and one. Where am I going to be able to hear the real story now? I'm a little confused. Meat eaters, campfire stories, okay. volume three. So volume one was close uh -huh. calls. Yep. Volume two was more close calls, mm -hmm. and then we had a catchy little subtitle. Volume three is going to be called Crazy Shit I Found, <laughs> but not. What are we okay. calling it? Do we know yet? Uh, like the, the, yeah, not really. Amazing Imagine, like, finds, archaeologists, whatever, finding plane crashes, finding missing bodies, finding archaeological sites, finding just whatever, weird junk. Sure. Well, what do you got right in front of you right now? You ready to talk about this? Well, I'm not, yeah, I don't think, do you feel like it's going to make the, uh, it's not going to make the, it's not gonna, no, go ahead. I want to hear about it. Okay. This this here is an extinct sea creature. Mm -hmm. 
I was hunting in Montana. It looks like a column. I've basically. found the little chunks before, but go on. Mm, I was hunting in Montana in 2019. And that morning, I was sitting behind my spotter and I glassed this up. It was in like some Badlands country. And I glassed it up from a long ways away. I didn't know what it was. You got to mm-hmm. explain what you saw, though. I saw that. Exactly no, that. But, but, people, people, but people have, at home who are listening. People want to um, say that it's a, it looks like a core sample. That you took from yeah. the earth. I thought when I came in and this was sitting here, mm-hmm. um, I thought for some reason there was a core sample in here. It is not a core sample. It looks like a core sample. You know how, when you look at it carefully, it's oval. Y- you know how some people got a game eye? Spencer's mm. got a Rock fossil eye. eye. And fo- mm-hmm. Yeah, and mushroom mm-hmm. eye. Really bad. I'm, I'm a very bad shed hunter. Um, I think I'm very good at mushrooms and, and rocks. Are you interested in sheds though? Terribly interested in sheds. You are? Yeah. Okay. I wish I was better. Because I didn't know if it was just like no. mind no. games. No. Seth Morris has the best shed eye I know. Yeah? No. I think it's it's hard for me to um, not do one and do the other because it seems like the best shed hunters are like scanning a large area. And when you're looking for mushrooms and, and rocks, you're often looking in like a, a very small area. Your cone, like your sonar, is tiny. Mm-hmm. The sheds, you're, you're like looking over a big area. I, uh, I, I can't, I can't come to that. I was walking through the woods with Seth. Mm-hmm. I had to duck my head to not poke a shed antler in my eye <laughs> that a buck had gotten hung up in some grapevine, uh-huh. and miss that. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think that says more about you than Seth. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and he's like, "Look, a shed hanging from a grapevine mm-hmm. at eye level <laughs> in the trail you just walked down." <laughs> so this looks like a core sample. It's uh. About as thick as a, a beer can, little little smaller. No, no. little smaller. Okay, how white big? claw. A white. Yeah, it's good. That's exactly it's good. It. If you put that's like two it. white claws on top of each other, right? Mm, maybe one, one and a half. half. One and a half. Yeah. Okay. Eighteen ounces. That's a good way. Very good at describing stuff. He's well, it's, it's, in your, it's in your hand right now, not mine. <laughs> this is an extinct sea creature. It's called a baculite. Baculites oh, yeah. lived from about sixty-six million years ago, which is when the dinosaurs also went extinct, to a hundred million years ago. Okay. Sounds like a long time, but if you if you want some context, like dinosaurs showed up like 200 million years ago and then disappeared 66 million years ago. So dinosaurs had already been around for 100 million years by the time these came around. It's yeah. a long time. And and they um their closest relative would be things that are cephalopods, like squid, mm-hmm. octopus, um their whole order, family, genus, it's all extinct. Uh, none of these are, are around anymore, or even close to it. They grew up to about seven feet long. They had um, extreme sexual dimorphism. A male was only about a third of the size as a female. Hmm. And they were, uh, they hung out in the middle of the water column. They ate plankton. And those little, like, fissures that you're seeing, those are called sutures on there. And that is how they would regulate the gas in their body. This, to imagine, imagine a squid. Take a squid, right? Yeah. And then give it a long cone body. It's like five or six feet long. Yep. That's what a baculite looked like. And then those little... So that's the body right there? This this is like the shell of it. Do you, so do, the, do their tentacles fossilize well? Uh, well, usually things that are soft don't fossilize very well. Mushrooms, for example, which would be similar... Yeah. Uh, in, in material to, to tentacles. I think they there's been 12 down. in the world that have been found hmm. okay. of, of fossils. So no, the, the tentacles uh, really, really poorly fossilize. This this would be the hard shell of Got it. it. So my, now, oh, go ahead. My, my question, let's back up a little mm-hmm. bit. When you said you glass this up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know what it was. Right. Palmer, right. you found it in your Knox. Yeah. In my spotting scope. Were you looking for deer? I was looking for deer, that's but a weird most, looking most deer. of my deer hunts devolve. Into well, that's something why he's else. got that buck sitting next to him because he got that buck later that day. That's right. right. So I, I found this baculite in the morning, and then that afternoon, only a few hundred yards away, I killed this buck. So you're telling me mm-hmm. you saw that through your scope? I didn't know what it was. I knew it was unnatural. Got like it. I was like that. That's something well, I should you were look wrong. at. Well, like, well, paint I, a, I was wrong. Paint, right. a, paint a picture too. Is it like mm-hmm. in the middle of like just some like, was it just some prairie grass upright? or was it like because like, like it, when I look at that I see yep. a fucking rock. Mm-hmm. It was in some badlandsy stuff um, that had a lot of like dead grass on it. This was late November, uh, and it was just laying there. It actually had a couple other smaller baculites next to it. Steve, you mentioned that you found 
some baculites before. Here's a smaller section. I found the sections. This Can this I tell you I a funny found, story. This oh, I found in Montana. This came from Wyoming. It's also good. a bat. That's what I have these. Mm -hmm. My kids have found them too. Yeah. Can I tell you a neat little story? Sure, yeah. I know an old timer that uh he's well into his eighties. Mm -hmm. He had one of these sitting on a shelf mm -hmm. in his house. And I didn't know what it was. And I said to him, What is that? And he said, I don't know. Some kind of fossil. I've, and he had had it for, I mean, decades, okay. I gather. Mm -hmm. He goes, I never, I never found anybody that could tell me what that was. Mm. He doesn't know the first thing about internet stuff. <laughs> so I put it on Instagram. I'm like, hey, what is this? Oh. And within seconds, uh -huh. I'm like, that's a baculite. And so I go and I show him, we go into Google mm -hmm. and type in baculite. And I pull up all these pictures of them. Yeah. Okay. And he's, he's pretty surprised by this whole revelation. He's very convinced that that's what he's holding. He's mm -hmm. very happy. A while later, he calls me. And he says, what was the website you were showing me the pictures? <laughs> I was like, it's, it's called, it's Google. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Native Americans <laughs> would find those a lot, and they call them buffalo stones. It's huh. Because if you look at the bottom, you could see sure. like you're looking at the undercarriage of bison. I think the black yeah. feet specifically had some origin stories about how they were good luck. Um, there was a woman who found one when they were in the middle of a famine. And then the next day, a whole herd of bison showed up and it like really turned things around for them. So baculite or buffalo calling stones. Mm. I've heard that. Buffalo calling. That's a buffalo calling stone. Does, that, does uh, it like work that. if you're applying for a buffalo tag? Well, it helped me kill this deer. <laughs> That afternoon. You always stick one of those in with your application? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. This is a cactus buck. No. Yep. Normally, uh, whitetails and mule deer will shed their velvet in late August, early September. It happens when the photo period changes. Days start getting shorter. Bucks elevate their testosterone, and then their velvet sheds. When that doesn't happen, it's a cactus buck, and that's kind of a catch-all term, right? Cactus bucks can come in many, forms, many shapes and sizes. It could be an antler doe. It could be a her hermaphrodite that has male and female sex organs. It could be a buck that lived a normal life as a buck, and then one day he messed up his testicles crossing a barbed wire fence, mm -hmm. got hit by a vehicle, was in a fight with another buck, and got stabbed in the nuts. Um, <laughs> and then that can mess with their hormones and create a cactus buck. Or I was hoping you'd keep going with that list. I was liking that yeah. list. Oh, okay. I can't think of any <laughs> other examples, you know. But I suppose you could have somebody this who's thing right in the <laughs> <a> <laughs> priest. Hit by Brody's a... priest right in a sack. Uh -huh. Shot by that a bad pistol. Shot. Right in the sack. <laughs> bad, All kinds of ways. A bad snag by, uh, snag by Chester's jig <laughs> rat. <laughs> yeah. You can take this leather man and pinch uh -huh. him in the sack. That's good. All sorts of ways. <laughs> this buck, for example, though, was born this way. Uh -huh. Um. His testicles had never dropped, and they were about the size of a cashew. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So when wow. you went to gut him, was there a sack? or was the, was the it, was, sack? it was an empty coin purse. But it was like a full-size mm -hmm. sack, but empty. It was, it was um, like absorbed up into the stomach. You could see like, okay, this is where his, his sack and testicles should be. Uh, and it was just like a slight change in the topography hmm. there. Did hmm. you shoot him? Like, you knew what he was, and you shot him for that reason? I knew what he was. Uh, he was with a few other bucks. It you was, mean you uh, knew he, what he was because he, was, he wasn't hard-horned? Right, yeah. right. And we had seen other bucks that weekend. Um, do you know you, when you see them that time of year that, it, that it's a cactus buck? Did you see any other cactus bucks? And I feel like we've talked about that this before. There's areas where there's a lot of it, man. Because yeah, so. we, I have found, like, there's a specific area mm -hmm. that we hunt, and it, it's like... We've seen so many of them, and this, it's just, it's bizarre. This idea gained traction after EHD. Um, 2012 was a terrible year for EHD. Gotcha. Um, and it, 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 the worst years of EHD are often when it's a wet season followed by a dry season. Uh, 2011 was super wet. 2012 was very dry for much of the country. That was when I think biologists started to notice more. They're like, oh, uh, you can have some weird stuff that happens to deer when they survive EHD. You see it with the hooves that get curled. Have you ever seen that? Um, oh, yeah. So that, that was an example. But not that hoof rot that's wreaking havoc in the Northwest. No, not that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think um, some folks, I don't know that it's been proven, but they've, they've come up with the idea that if you have an area that was hit, by, hit bad by EHD, but you have some deer that survive it, uh, cactus bucks become more common. I shot this buck in 2019. I went through a check station on the way home. 
Uh, they had told me they had checked about 100 deer that day, and this was the second cactus buck. So for that area, it was about 2% of deer, but I think, uh, you know, could be all the way up to 10% in some mm-hmm. spots. I, remember, I can't remember what, uh, some guys were telling me about one of those islands in Alaska, in more western Alaska that has the introduced, I can't remember if it was a Fognac or Kodiak or one of those islands that has introduced Sitka, you know, introduce black tails. Mm-hmm. Talking about some area where it's just like a pile of them running around. Yeah, I, I never found out if it was true or not, but it's just like common in some spot, like an introduced herd. Yep. Huh. So it was one of my favorite days of hunting ever. I found this. It back brought together like, two of the three things you like. Oh, what's the third? Four. What's the fourth? Well, you like sports a little bit. Mm-hmm. You like your wife. <laughs> You like stones and you like bucks. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Two, Were two you with four. your wife that day? No, I wasn't. Mm. So brought no. together two of the four things he likes. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite rocks and one of my favorite bucks. Have you ever seen how they preserve the velvet on a deer? That was my next question yeah. for you. They have like three ways, is my understanding. Is that, one that's going to live here in the studio for a while? Yeah, yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. If, if, if we're good with it. No, uh, we're, still, like, we're still decorating. We're still moving like in. Three this should ways. be a good trivia. Mm. About cactus bucks? One one of them is uh, freeze drying, which I think has become more common. I hadn't heard that. Another one is they'll scrape the velvet off, and then they'll put an artificial velvet on. It's I don't like, like that. Uh, spraying, you know, insulation. Yeah, I'm, or oppo- like I'm that. opposed to that. And then the third way, which is how this one was done, is they have a chemical cocktail that's similar to embalming fluid that they just inject all over. I'm mm-hmm. familiar with that. That's that's how this one preserved. It costs yeah, me it's extra. hard to take care of. Yeah. Cost me an extra fifty dollars from the taxidermist. Man, when we we used to hunt caribou in August when they had all that velvet. My God, does that stuff get nasty, man? Like you don't think of flies. Mm-hmm. It's all full of blood. So you go to grab them and your hands get bloody. You don't think what? of flies getting on antler. Yeah, they love it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's just these fly ridden messes. And so I I used to think that someday I was going to try to save one, but you just can't. Yeah. And then it starts to rot and it's falling off and it's nasty. Yeah. But I did want to get a big bunch of that velvet and get it tanned and make like a bra for my wife man <laughs> imagine like lined lined with that that's antler good. velvet man uh-huh that's funny this one was does she know preserve. about this plan oh yeah she like, i wanted to do one out of like yeah i was telling her about it she's like you just don't understand no one wants just it understand. <laughs> just don't understand you wouldn't get it i think she doesn't understand <laughs> to get her like a fur a velvet lined bra what do you think, Corinne, is that, why is that not appealing? Um, I, I, I find it appealing. <laughs> oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah, well, Corinne, yeah, yeah she also has animal part earrings. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. It seems like it's it'd be so warmer funny. and all get out. Yeah, I think it'd be real comfortable. But she's like, it's just not a cold area. Like, your fingers get cold, yeah, your toes but, get cold. Yeah, you don't have, like, cold, you know, you can, like, you my breasts about, are cold. You can think about it as, I mean, I, I wouldn't think about it as whether it's insulating or not, but more just, like, a texture, like, what's what's comfortable to the touch sure yeah yeah, yeah. She, she's thinking about it the wrong way she's like it's like lots of things like your cheeks get cold <laughs> your hands get cold feet no, get I cold think it's a great steve's idea. gonna start a new move, uh, lingerie you company yeah. you should move mm-hmm. forward with it yeah um yeah that's great man i like that thank you i'll try, we got what are we gonna kick out <clears throat> Oh, we'll There's a that. lot of white space there. Yeah, no, or is, yeah, it, or is this the aesthetic? Is this like the no, the no? It'll, be, it'll, wind it'll wind up being okay. It'll wind up being yeah. We're gonna keep oddities. redecorating and it'll be packed full of oddities. Ah, oh, we should move our uh, uh, Warner Bla- Bratzler meat tenderizer. Oh, that's test a great idea. Here. Put a little meat eater cap on him. Call him Warner B. Yeah, or he can go on one of the other shelves yeah. in our new place. Mm-hmm. I'll point out this fossil. It was found on public land. It was on BLM. And it's not against the law. It's not against the law. It is legal to collect common invertebrates. Uh. And they specifically call out, you know, they're, they're not uh, very specific, but they say like common invertebrates such as mollusks, clams, um, things like that. This would be a type of mollusk. They're very common. They're found around the world. Um, so I kept it, and that's legal. I had a great uh, exchange with Spencer one time. I think I hit you up on an inReach device. Mm, okay. And I said, we had found a huge block of old seafloor. There mm. was a clam bed. Mm-hmm. I remember. And my daughter wanted me to pack it out. Yep. It's still sitting there because it's about 70 pounds. <laughs> it was quite a ways off the river. Uh-huh. And I texted you about what are the rules about it. Yep. 
And what was the poundage you're allowed? Well, so they, they get into specifics for petrified wood. Uh -huh. It's like, um, I think it's 25 pounds a day. Can't exceed 250 pounds in a year. And then they have something like you can't take a piece that's larger than X amount of pounds. I don't remember what that was. When it comes to uh, the, the fossils, though, they just say you cannot collect to trade barter or sell um and you must collect in reasonable quantities that's what that's what the that's what you text me i don't know what a reasonable you quantity would is me, does it seem like a reasonable quantity <laughs> i think if it fits in your backpack <laughs> it'd be a reasonable quantity and i'm like it's unreasonable that i would tote this out of here but it seems uh -huh. like a reasonable quantity sure. but no i propped it up it's still sitting there where i found it mm -hmm. um presumably so yeah. What's that? Unless someone it, thought it was a reasonable quantity and they... I don't think anyone's going to carry out. that out no. of there, man. Uh, all right, one last thing. Max, um, you you have your grant... You've taken possession of your grandfather's fishing hat? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a fishing hat. It's a do-it-all hat. Is he no longer with us? No, he's not. He passed away in 2019. Oh. Yeah. So... Did he specifically leave that hat to you? Uh. No, I think my dad took it, and then uh, I took it from my dad. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, it's kind of a funny story behind this hat. Um, it's uncomfortable as crap if you can't see it right now. It looks like very waxed. Yeah, or like very dip, waxy dipped and waxed. And... Um, oh, geez. It is like an old man hat. It is yeah. an old man hat. <laughs> you can picture Brody. You can picture Brody. No, man. Oh, that's that's like grungy hats. No, that's like, I don't like them. Oh, you like a nice clean hat? Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm bald. Like, it's got to feel good. <laughs> no, that hat. You ever think about not... lining your hat with antler velvet? Well, <laughs> now that you mention this it. This hat needs it. That is not a bad idea. Um, but my dad, uh, it was my grandpa's birthday, and my dad got that for my grandpa for his birthday. Uh huh. Well, not this hat, sorry. He got a different hat for his birthday, and my grandpa hated it. And so he took the hat that my dad gave him put it on a shelf, went out, took my dad's credit card, bought this hat, which was more expensive, mm -hmm. and didn't tell my dad about it. And then he was just walking around with his hat, and my dad's like, hey, what happened to this hat? And grandpa didn't say anything about it. And then my dad's birthday came around next month, and the hat that my dad got my grandpa, my grandpa just gave it back to him. Sure. Because he didn't like it. As a present, right? Yeah, as a present. This and guy knows just, what he likes. Yeah, and he mm -hmm. found... This hat was that one of your main out. That was one of your main outdoor mentors. Yeah, big time. Was he prone to stealing people's credit cards? <laughs> uh, I hope not. I guess I don't know. Do you, do you um, wear that hat? I do not. No, you this hat not. sits on sits on the wall, sits on the shelf. So mm. um, like keepsake. Yeah. yeah, big time. Uh, but yeah, um, I think my I think I was six. Uh, there's a photo of me and my grandpa when we were when I was six um, out pheasant hunting, and he was wearing this hat. Oh, really? Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Um, Think of all the adventures this hat oh, has big been time. on. Oh, uh, big time. Big time. Uh, but no, I was just just trying to think of something cool to bring in. And um, I was like, that's really cool to me because without my grandpa, I don't think I would have got involved in hunting. Mm -hmm. And then if I wouldn't have gotten involved in hunting, I would never have picked up a camera. And if I never would have picked up camera, I wouldn't be here right now. So. Oh. You know, maybe well we shouldn't put yeah. that on a shelf in the studio. I feel like it's a little too precious for. Well, may, what's the? How do you preserve something like that? We're talking about the <laughs> the pistol. You can put some Scotch Guard on it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Know. You can like put it in like a blocks of epoxy. Oh yeah, you know yeah. what, man? You know how people do that? Where they um resin so, yeah, set yeah. it in a block of resin? That'd be yeah. pretty badass, man. If I, I had, I, 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 like I got real like good this. at it. That's all I would do. It's Pour cool. resin. All my stuff in a box of resin, man. I'd have like stuff that I was like, damn it, I shouldn't have put that in there. You could build a house out of all that. <laughs> oh, yeah, just make your house out of stuff yeah. you sunk into blocks or yeah. resin. All your cool stuff. Pretty you wouldn't cool. need to hang it on the wall because it no. was the wall. Yeah. That's very cool. I, I don't think I'll do that with this. <laughs> no. Steve, did you know that Max is a fresh trivia champion? You won one? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure did. Who was there? Was Dr. Brody, Brody was there. Brody was there. Yeah. Was Dr. Randall? Dr. R Randall was there. Giannis was Baron there. Baron Square whooped him. Yeah. Did you, be, you beat Giannis? In, there was a three-way like tiebreaker. Uh, tie yeah, three-way tie, yeah. You, you won one with Dr. Randall and Brody in the room? Yep. Do you want to play the tiebreaker, Steve? See if you did. Gotten close. Yeah, yeah. I'll ask it? you the was, question. Uh, oh, yeah, then we're going to wrap the show up. Go ahead, go ahead What year did Steve Irwin pass away? If you can remember, he 
uh, it, passed it, away by Stingray. Now, wasn't it? That's right. Yep. I, I didn't win trivia, but I got it, the tiebreaker. Yeah, exactly you got right. the correct answer. 2009. 2007. No, 2006. 2006. 2006. Brody was right on the nose, so we had the extra $100 donation, but he wasn't in the tiebreaker. Oh, you did that? Oh, yeah, but you didn't let him win it. No, no, no. no. Max won. He said 2008. Me and Brody argued about that game the other night. <laughs> non stop on the boat. <laughs> well, Brody didn't. Brody just sat there. But I had a lot to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know how they're sore losers? I told Steve he's a sore, sore winner. winner. <laughs> uh, I had to yell over to his bolt multiple times to give him various <laughs> thoughts on why I felt like it was a, it was a scam. Uh huh. Just when it was nice Even and though quiet he had too. won. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, studio's shaping up. It's going to look good. I like the muskox. Whose idea was the muskox? That's great. It nice it's a whole dang wall. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Dual, dual purpose. Gonna, someday I'm going to comb that and get all the kibbit. You remember giving me the yeah, head portion of it? To make those it, flies. Halloween mask. I want to comb out enough of that stuff to have a hat made out of that oh. kibbit. I think it's the word for it. Kibbe. It's, it's more, it's like better than any wool for hmm. insulatory quality. Mm. And I think you could comb out a whole hat out of there and you wouldn't even be able yeah. to tell from looking at it. Because it looks like a Bigfoot hanging there. Mm-hmm. That's what I first thought. Walked in there, I thought someone got a Bigfoot. Did you get Did you get that? <laughs> I killed that. None of that Island. And you thought it was a Bigfoot? No, I'm joking. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, years ago, years ago, I drew, I don't even think you can draw it right now. Years ago, I drew... Um, uh, uh, muskox tag for Nunavak Island. It's an episode. Yeah, yeah it was like yeah. DX001 or something like that was the hunt number. Um, and yeah, man, it was, we had a good time. Steve, you're fixing to put First Light out of business with all this muskox and velvet clothing. Oh, it's true. Well, I'm gonna roll it into yeah. the. I'm oh, gonna okay. roll it into the lineup, man. <laughs> yeah, I know that would be bad, wouldn't it? Because I could just picture them being like, you know, the, my bra line came out. And it, <laughs> <laughs> Your muskox hat. Oh, goodness. Okay, bye, yeah. everybody. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>